Hi, my name is Marcus van Amsik. My talk is about neural networks and their application to images. Uh, it's a kind of a fun talk where we take all the most recent developments in neural networks like deep dream, image classification, retrieval, and apply it in the Mathematica name fr uh, framework to several images. The end basically is an image restyle where we create a second self-portrait of Pablo Picasso. That's basically it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Marcus van Amsik. My talk is about neural networks and their application to images. Basically, we do all the fun things that have been done with neural networks recently in image processing. That is image classification, image retrieval, image uh, style transfer, colorization of black and white images uh, and the like. Uh, the last example, which is most fun, I guess, is a deep dream uh, that you may have known or may heard about, uh, uh, which was published by Google. All right, uh, I understand that most of you are already experts now in neural networks and images uh, after seeing the results of uh, the competition. Uh, so maybe I just don't tell you anything new anymore. Anyhow, uh, for those of you not so uh, firm in uh, uh, neural networks, I'll just take two minutes to explain all of neural networks, uh, just to establish a little bit the uh, a jargon and then I'll continue. Okay, so the human brain basically is the idea of a neural network which we try to imitate and this is a, a picture generated in Mathematica of the visual cortex that does via neural networks all the image processing that we do. Maybe up front just a few little uh, parameters. Uh, the brain has 86 billion neurons, about as many trees as there are in the Amazon forest. 5.8 million kilometers of wiring, 200 trillion synapses connecting those uh, neurons. That is about the number of leaves in the Amazon forest. Uh, it can do one petaflops of computation, probably more. It's hard to estimate. And most amazingly, your brain runs on 20 watts. So uh, we're not there yet, but maybe we'll get there uh, one day. Okay, so that brain function we just imitate. And being a physicist, I really simplify it to the utmost possible way. The brain essentially is a function f with uh, some weights, some synapses that you can change. We call them weights, w. So these are the parameters of the function f. And you put an input in there, a question, a visual sensation or whatever, x, and you want to have an answer coming out. This is y. So essentially, all we have to do is find this function f, depending on omega, uh, mapping x to y. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, in contrast to what they always tell you in Star Trek, you do need emotions. The emotions are essentially your loss or, uh, or cost function because they tell you what you want to do or what you want to learn. And uh, the emotion in neural networks is uh, the loss function L or the loss layer, which you put around your network and then you try to optimize or minimize, depending on how you see it, uh, the weights W uh, for a certain task, minimizing L. So that's essentially what you do, training a network, the learning task, the hard part. And that's done essentially simply by gradient descent. You try to find the optimum, so you take the gradient, walk down the slope, and try to find the minimum with respect to L. Uh, this works fairly nicely because there's a chain rule, so you can take here the gradient of L with respect of F of W in there, and that's the gradient of L with respect to F, and then the gradient of the uh, neural network with respect to its weights. And you numerically update that in steps of delta W, by which you change the weights, by calculating this uh, gradient, not necessarily for all the data, uh, but just for parts of your data, uh, which is then called, uh, sorry, now I'm stuck. Uh, the B stands for, uh, okay, well, for, just for a set of data, not the entire data, which makes it not a precise or exact gradient, but just a stochastic gradient. And that you're used to learn W by just always changing W to obtain uh, an optimum. So that's essentially all of uh, neural networks. Uh, it took three minutes, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but um, okay, so having established that, we now apply uh, all of this uh, to image processing. And uh, I hope to cover these five topics, image classification, that's a classic in a way. I uh, have to start with that. Then image retrieval, that's the uh, art of finding an uh, image that very much looks like the image you're looking at without tagging. That's the, uh, that's the spin in this. Then uh, I'll 
test a little bit the neural networks we generate by doing what's called dreaming, trying to invoke images uh, in these neural networks. Do what you all now know how to do, style transfer, and last but not least, I do image colorization. All right, uh, so one command that has been around now for two and a half years in Mathematica is image identify. And just to remind you of what you can do, I'll take an image, I'll plug it in, and hopefully if everything works fine, it doesn't download, yeah, it doesn't download a neural network. That's good, it gives you the answer right away. You can be very specific by setting the op uh, option specificity, specificity, specificity goal. Uh, to high, and uh, thus you get the tiger. But you can also uh, change that slightly. You can set that to low, and then you just say, well, it's a big cat, a pussy cat. Or uh, if you want to be very uh, general, you can ask for uh, this to be an animal. And all in all, you can even get the probabilities for these kind of uh, classifications. Now, what is this? This essentially is a very ordinary classification network which, however, does not uh, only map against a list of classes, but on top of that a set of classes, we have a, a kind of hierarchy tree of more uh, entities that we also then consider as unions, uh, probability unions of the leaves of that tree. And uh, I'll just quickly uh, demonstrate what's basically under the hood. What's under the hood is uh, what you can upload with net model is this uh, uh, classification network. It's pretty much a classical classification network. It comes uh, with an input being the uh, array of uh, image or color values or pixel values. Um, then it does a convolution layer, does some normalization, has a ReLU, as a um, um, nonlinear uh, component, and then you repeat doing this. And where it becomes a little bit out of the ordinary is down here where you don't have ordinary convolution layers anymore, but these are so-called inception layers. They're slightly different. Uh, a convolution layer always basically takes a certain scale, a certain area, and tries to uh, construct a feature out of it. But the problem is that features come in different sizes. If you have somebody standing close to you, he's a much bigger feature than somebody far away. And therefore, one has to somehow cope with that effect uh, that you have to let maybe certain features just walk through without being processed at that level. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what an exception layer does. It basically is a set of parallel convolution layers. This is a convolution layer that uh, basically, uh, well, we can scroll to it. Does a, uh, scroll up, it's a convolution layer. Then uh, uh, you basically just reduce and have another con uh, convolution layer. You do it on one uh, pipeline, and then you have another parallel pipeline where you just have fewer steps. So you basically take into account that you have different scales that you have to process in your um, in your image. Uh, other than that, it's very much like the ordinary convolution layer that you have for the MNIST data set. Okay, the next interesting thing you may wonder about is how large is this thing? And uh, what's interesting is not only, wait a minute, this is, oh, the thing is unfortunately the whole thing, the definition just went away, I have to re-implement that. Uh, I implemented for you here a parameter count that counts the number of weights and biases in a network. Unfortunately, only the top line is left. I just accidentally apparently deleted the rest uh, scrolling through this, uh, preparing the talk while standing here five minutes ago. Nevertheless, uh, the results are still here. So if I run the parameter count on this particular network for image identify, you will find that there are 14 million parameters in the network that have to be trained, which then we do for you so that you can just download the model. And uh, just as a check, if you compare the byte count of the network with the numbers of parameters, you'll see that there's a rel relation of one to four, which may basically means that the parameters are encoded as four byte uh, single precision floating point numbers, essentially. Okay, so having looked under the hood, uh, we can extract even more. We can, for example, see how the encoder works. The encoder basically always takes a resized image of 224 times 224 RGB. It subtracts a mean image to just uh, look at the interesting parts, basically uh, color values that are out of an ordinary dark or bright, not the boring gray. Uh, and then uh, you can read off the image size that's being processed, the color space, color channels, and so forth. The same you can do with outer encoder. And here it becomes a little bit more interesting because here you have now a classification. 
you have labels and the number of labels called dimensions, and I can call this up. And I'll find out that uh, this particular network works with 4,315 labels. And I can just give you here a random sample of them. Printing them all being at entities takes a while, so I just do a small set. And you can see that you can here get long beach fern, prairie sunflower, and so forth. So very specific entities that this network can recognize. But on top of this network, or this entity list, you have a hierarchy uh, tree. Uh, which basically is depicted here, not a single tree, but a set of trees. Uh, we can count through this of the order of 17 or so. And if I just pick out one of them, uh, this is a tree of locations. So all the endpoints here are entities uh, of the classes that I can recognize uh, with image identify. And all the intermediate uh, nodes in this tree are then uh, superclasses that uh, um, combine several of the uh, true uh, leaf classes, like here the most general class is location and that then par is partitioned into regions or spaces uh, and uh, the regions are then districts, communities, cities, slums and so forth. So being sub entities and uh, essentially when you do image identify you not only look at the leaves of the classification but also on the branches that are put on top of it. Okay, um, so much for image identify. The our basically main classification function in Mathematica. And now I'll utilize that function uh, doing image retrieval. So the idea is pretty straightforward. You have an image like here, the, a pantheon, uh, a temple somewhere in Greece, I guess. Uh, you run it through the network, but you don't run it all the way to the classification layer. You stop somewhere earlier because you don't want to do a classification. You just want to get the main features that are somewhere intermittent in this neural network. So you cut this off, which generates then essentially a feature vector. That feature vector is a point in a k-dimensional uh, feature space. And in that space, you just can train a nearest uh, a function, calculating what is the nearest point to the point you just generated. Uh, and then you can just find all the neighboring points. And these are most likely the images that you'd like to retrieve being very similar. And uh, well, we just do this. We'll take the net, uh, the image identify net that I just generated. We extract only layer one through a layer global underscore pool, which is just about above the uh, classification level. And then we at uh, attach a flattened layer because that was actually not a flat vectorized layer, but uh, uh, a layer as an array. And uh, as an input, we still take images being 24 times 24 RGB. And then basically putting an image in there, I get here a vector of uh, 1,024 values, so a 1K feature vector. And that I can now use to basically generate a database that I can search visually. This is a very small data set, just a data set of uh, roughly 20 dogs. And uh, now for every dog uh, or image in that data set, I have to now calculate the corresponding feature point generate a nearest function in that space. And then I can write here a function that basically takes from an incoming image, the feature vector, looks for the nearest uh, feature point in the, date in the feature space, just takes the first one, and then extracts exactly the corresponding image from the data set that I have. So that is then my nearest dog function. And uh, we can say, see if that works. I'll just take as a first example, a retriever, hoping that this helps to retrieve the image. Um, OK, so apparently it does work. Now, a Yorkshire Terrier, yep, looks like it. And this seems to be a poodle or a doodle. Yep, also seems to work. So uh, this would help to find now certain cars in your data set or, uh, or alike. Uh, by the way, this has been now, uh, I've done this artificially to explain the concept, but all of this also is built into a function that's called feature extraction. So feel free to look into that. You don't have to redo everything I'm doing here. OK, uh, now I go into dreaming. Um, first, um, just to play around, uh, I don't dream the natural way. I just uh, try to find out what a single neuron does or what, uh, what kind of image a single neuron really excites. So roughly speaking, this is a very simplified version of my um, my inception network. I have an image here, which is then being processed uh, via some convolution layers to uh, some linear layer, which is then fully connected to some classification layer. And what I will do now is con construct a loss function that just looks 
uh, uh, if one single neuron, a particular neuron in the classification layer here, gets excited and uh, makes sure that all the other ones are calm. And if that's the case, if that's my loss function, then I can train this network, but I don't train all the layers in that network. I'll just attach another layer up front, which is my image, and I only train that image to be optimal to excite exactly that single neuron. So uh, I'll just, given the time limit, I just uh, scroll a little bit here fast through the code. Sorry for that. I know that's always a little bit annoying. So what I, what I do here is I extract the encoder decoder because I need parts of it to reassemble the network that then trains the uh, first layer. Um, okay, oh by the way, these are the different uh, uh, classes that I can excite. So it go all the way back down to bathroom tissues. Um, then uh, I have here a feature vector that can I generate from this. Uh, another net encoder. And this basically is now an encoder that takes a certain feature like the neuron for tigers and generates then a unit vector that is just one here where the tiger neuron excites and always zero otherwise. And with that I can then uh, generate down here a feature loss function that basically is plus one for all the neurons that are not tiger, minus one for the neuron that is, uh, is tiger. And then if these get excited, the one that the tiger neuron gets uh, preferred uh, to, to make the loss function go down. Furthermore, just to get decent looking images, I put in here another loss function. It's called total variation loss function, which basically is the norm of the gradient of the image, which uh, ensures that I don't have lots of variations in the image, that it has a certain continu continuity like natural images have. OK, and this generates now a graph. Oh, this doesn't look good. Uh, Take table. This uh, generates now uh, an, uh, a, a neural network that I'm going to train. And the important thing is basically here this very first layer. layer. That's a constant array layer, which I just initiate with some random numbers. And that is basically the layer that is getting trained. And that is then the image that I will extract at the end of the, uh, the training period. And um, so here I train. And the training here is just an ordinary training. I have the network. I have just as data simply the order uh, to uh, go for that particular tiger neuron. Uh, I balance here the feature loss and the uh, total variation loss. And then, this is important, I have here the learning rate multipliers which tell me to just um, mutilate the image and none of the other uh, network, uh, network layers. So I don't train the network, but just the image. And I'll do all this on my GPU, if that works fine. And uh, just uh, as an explanation, you may have found it out, it is helpful to have a GPU. Now, all the Mac users are mostly out of luck because they have a GPU, but not the right one, not an NVIDIA one. So uh, you cannot run CUDA. And it would help sometimes either to do it on the uh, internet uh, uh, or you have here an external eGPU that allows you to uh, train the network. And this would now take a total of uh, one minute and, well, roughly two minutes, which I don't have, so I'll stop here. Uh, but you see, it's finite time. And then this would allow me to extract the first uh, layer that I just uh, established, and that layer contains the image that I have already pre-computed here. And you see this is a tiger. Now you might say, well, this doesn't look like a tiger. And uh, you're somewhat right. But what you can see a little bit is that it's full of typical tiger stripes. So essentially, it goes and identifies a tiger by looking for typical stripe patterns in the image. And it also works in the sense that if I put this image into my inception network, it says, yes, I'm a tiger. And then you can, of course, goof around, make me a tiger. So I'll take my image, put a little bit of tiger in it. And then when I classify myself, I, ah, this is. Uh, met, oh, no, that's uh, typical typos, last minute typos, changing things. OK. And OK, I go through as a tiger. Uh, all right, uh, deep dream uh, part two. Um, 
quickly, uh, this is pretty much the same story. It, there's uh, two uh, modifications here. First, I don't excite or uh, uh, yeah, uh, look for uh, just one single neuron firing, but I basically have here a loss function, dream, uh, deep dream loss, that excites a whole layer. So if a whole layer gets really excited, it's good. It's basically when you sleep and dream, your uh, brain uh, starts to process certain layers, start to get active, and then they, in a way, project onto your visual cortex then these images that you see uh, while you dream. Oh, that's the idea a little bit. Then there's uh, one other uh, modification. You saw that I just got typically just uh, small tiger stripes all over. I didn't have a big tiger, a small tiger. So it helps to do all of this at different scales. So I just don't do it as, at one scale, but I do it here at uh, six different scales. Uh, so I have a kind of a pyramid of data. I have to have a pyramid of nets, which makes the whole thing a little bit more complicated, but feel free to go through this at home. And then, uh, Last but not least, then I can go ahead and train uh, the network. And that, uh, uh, in a sense, then modifies an image, my input image being this kind of tree image. And what I get here is this result. Uh, you can fool around with it. If you excite different layers in the network, you will see to get, that you get different features. For example, this layer goes pretty much for dogs. If you take another layer, it's more inclined to go for uh, birds. Apparently, birds have a different number of features to be combined than dogs, and that's why there's a difference. So this is great fun to play with. Um, OK, we're running out of time, big boy. OK, let me hurry up. Um, this I will go through very quickly now, since you're all now experts in style transfer. Um, um, there are two versions. One is the fast version, which basically does an encoding, then has a layer that takes the statistics of one image and imposes statistics, the variation and the mean uh, onto another image, and that gives you, uh, and then it decodes everything, and that gives you an, a sort of uh, image style transfer. It's not that great, so you have seen the images, I guess. Um, well, let's generate one here. So this is uh, the Manhattan skyline, uh, a la Van Gogh. You see there's a prevalence of diagonal lines. Uh, this is a Matisse. So, uh, or Kandinsky, I think. Um, there's a better way to do it, but a more, uh, well, demanding thing. Essentially, it goes, again, a little bit like what we just did. Um, we have here, again, uh, a network. This time it's a VGG16 network, where I extract, again, a part of it. I just go to a certain layer. I don't go all the way through. So I just want to combine images at a certain uh, feature layer. I don't, I'm not interested in the classification at the end of the neural network. And then I generate here uh, two loss functions, one that compares the input image and, uh, of the content that I try to preserve and make sure that what comes out is very close to the content image. So basically, this is an L2 norm uh, uh, comparison between two images. And then to uh, compare styles, or to make styles uh, look alike, I have here a statistical uh, 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 loss function that is a little bit more uh, inclined uh, to uh, the statistics of mean and variance. This is a gram matrix, uh, gram matrix uh, where I calculate the correlations between uh, and the total variations of the, uh, sorry, uh, the correlations between two images or the neighboring points. And here, on top of it, I again have a total uh, loss function. Uh, well, there's something wrong here. And uh, OK, I'll, I'll put this into one network train again here, constant array layer. And uh, I'll just scroll through three here because I'm running out of time. And uh, at the end of uh, the day, you then train the network with this specification. You can uh, give to different weights to the content loss or the style loss. And uh, if everything works well, you then get a much better imp impression of the uh, style than you had before. And uh, just one quick example here. I'll just pre-calculate. This is an uh, image of uh, Pablo Picasso and a style. And uh, here, I basically changed the weighting between loss and uh, content. So first, I have only the content, the original image. And I put more and more style of the uh, painting onto his image. And uh, so it's basically a new self-portrait of Pablo Picasso that he never did, actually. 
Okay, last but not least, one minute to go. Uh, we have a colorization network. I'm not sure if that got introduced this morning. The idea is that you again have your two networks that uh, go for mid-level features and uh, for global features. The mid-level features basically just look what's there locally on an image as an indication, and the global one basically tries to find out what actually is in the image. Is it an indoor scene? Is it a landscape or whatsoever? And these two then get combined and this combination then is used to train a layer that uh, comes up with colors. So if you put a black and white image in there, you basically uh, train here a network that produces a color that's missing. So you can do that very easily by taking color images, creating grayscale, and then uh, training the image that way. Uh, furthermore, you not only have this loss function, but the loss function with respect to classification. And all of that is here in this uh, color net that you can download from our net model repository. It consists of all these four uh, neural networks in there that you can see here, one, two, three, four. And then you can just apply it. This is a now a function, putting this network to use. And uh, so this is grayscale and reconstructing the image. This was original color. This is not the right color. Wait a minute, gray. Oops, gray. This is the recolored version. So you don't see a big difference if you look closely, though this is an autumn. And the recoloring didn't get it straight that actually the colors had already turned orange, so it's missing that. Or you can take old images. This is an image of my grandfather from exactly 100 years ago and put color into the image, so it's great fun. Okay, so unfortunately time is up. Uh, there's one more goodie in here. It's a... Uh, um, uh, auto encoder to do uh, denoising. Uh, feel free to uh, use it and to uh, figure out how well that works. The idea is basically once you know what you're encoding, you can really well uh, reduce the noise in an image. And uh, this brings me to the end of my talk, uh, just pointing out that there are two more talks today one about neural network framework, just uh, after this talk by Sebastian Bodenstein at Little Chief. And a little later, there's a neural networks uh, workshop for computer vision. Uh, also in Little Chief at 3.30. And then last but not least, come down to the basement. Uh, we have an image processing booth where we can show you all these things on top. Thank you.